In this video, I'll show you how to edit your color infrared photos in Adobe Photoshop. We will go from this to this. This technique will work with color infrared images shot on a converted camera using a 590 to 720 nanometer filter or with an unconverted camera using a 720 nanometer filter. I first covered this process nearly two years ago in just my second video. The interface to Camera Raw has changed since then, and I've learned a lot since then. I'd like to share what I've learned with you. At the end of the video, I'll discuss some free downloads that you can use to make the process even easier. If you prefer a written guide, the basic steps here are covered in my free ebook titled Getting Started with Your Converted, Infrared, or Full Spectrum Camera. Check it out. The link is in the description. So when you open up a RAW or DNG file in Adobe Photoshop, it's going to open up Camera Raw. So here we're looking at Camera Raw. If you've used Lightroom, then the settings will be very familiar because the interface for Camera Raw is now much closer to the interface for Lightroom. The tooling is very similar as well to the develop module in Lightroom. So that's certainly very helpful. So the first thing we want to do with an infrared image like this is remove some of the red cast and make the colors a little bit more manageable. So if I go into the basic panel and I select the uh, white balance picker tool or hit the I key, that'll bring up this white balance picker. And typically I want to select something more neutral in the image. So something that's uh, white like clouds or the, the granite face here of the mountain and use that as a way to try to get to a white tone. But the challenge here, as you can see, is that I can't quite get there. There's still a bit of a red cast in the image. If I look over at the white balance, you can see that the temperature is at 2000 Kelvin. The range here goes from 2000 to 50,000 and that's really red at that end and at 2000 starts to get better, but it's just not quite far enough. So what we're going to need to do is use a custom profile. I have a, another video with instructions on how to create a custom profile that's getting more challenging as the software being used is not always available for download and doesn't work on some modern operating systems. So the alternative is there's a infrared profile pack that I've created where you can download a custom profile for your camera. So if we look at one of those profiles, I've got a couple here. I've got one that'll shift the color temperature by negative 100 and negative 50. And typically for most cameras, one of these two settings will, will cover us. It doesn't matter which one really, because as long as we get to a good white balance, that's what we're looking for. So we've made the shift here. And so now if I use the eyedropper to try to get a white balance, then I'm going to get a much more desirable look. You'll see that the, the mountain faces are much more neutral in tone. I have a nice blue color on the trees and a nice golden color in the sky. And there's a lot of separation between them. And that will allow me to swap colors and to manage my colors much better. You'll also notice if we look over at color temperature, that it's it's now falling in the middle of the scale. It's not pegged at the end. And so that is a, another good indicator that we have a better white balance. If that wasn't the case, you could always switch to the other profile and try that one as well. Another thing that you can do with setting a white balance here in Camera Raw is you can pick a spot with the eyedropper, but you could also draw a box with it. So if you have a range, a section that you want to sample from and get an average for the white balance, then you could do that as well. And that would give you, that could give you a good result. So that's just another option that you can play with when we're working on a white balance. So the next thing that I want to do is start to think about some of the other settings. So I've got a couple choices here at this point. I can either immediately go exit Camera Raw and go into Lightroom, or I can continue working in Camera Raw. And I think that having the flexibility to, to go either way is really powerful. So I, that's one of the things that I want to cover here. You can start to make some changes here in the way that your image looks. So let's, let's make a few changes, but then I want to preserve the ability to come back. Let's go into the curve section and add a little bit of contrast. So we'll pick up a medium contrast, go back into basic. This image was shot with a 200 millimeter lens, often, you know, looking way into the distance. So there's a little bit of haze. So I can add a little bit of dehaze to the image to try to cut back on that a bit. That's good for now. We'll make some small changes. Let's talk about how we can come back later. When we're ready to open the image, we can select the open button or click this open, open as object 
open as copy. If I click open, this will rasterize the image and open it in Photoshop as a flat layer. So I've lost all of the, the raw information that's contained in a smart object. And that's fine, but it does limit my ability to come back and change the color temperature later. Another option is to open as object, which will open this as a smart object and then allow me to come back later and reopen camera raw and have full control of the white balance and all of these controls. That's the option that I prefer. So I typically will select open as object. If you'd like that to be your default, then you can go up to the preferences in the upper right hand corner, open up the preferences menu on the left, select workflow, and then down here, select open in Photoshop as smart objects. And that'll give you that default option to open as an object. So let's go ahead and open up this image as an object. Okay, so I have this image open as an object. I'm gonna hit control zero to fill the space available. And then the next thing I want to do is swap my color. So let's look at a couple different methods for doing that. So the first method is using the channel mixer. So we go into channel mixer. We look at the output channel red. I'm gonna change red to zero and we'll tab down to blue and change that to 100. So red is now blue. And then we will go to the blue channel and we will change red to 100% and blue to zero. So now blue is red. So now you can see that I've swapped my channels. The sky is a bit of a teal color and we've got a much more colorful kind of reddish, orangish red tone in the trees. So that is one method for swapping my colors. Let's look at a second method. So I will hide this layer. We'll go back down to the adjustment layers and I will select invert. So this will throw up an invert layer on the screen. And then I wanna change the blend mode. So I'll go to the blend mode here and I will select hue or color. They pretty much do the same thing. It's gonna depend on your sensor and your camera, your settings. But in many cases for me, the invert tends to produce a sky that's a little bit closer to a true blue sky. But if you're playing with colors either way, then you've got a lot of flexibility in either of these methods. There's a whole variety of other methods that are available that produce the same result as invert. So methods with curves and levels and a variety of things that you, can, that you can use that all end up performing the same invert function. So these are the two most common methods that I'll use for swapping colors in Photoshop. So the next thing that I'll typically do is play with the colors a little bit more. And I'll do that with a hue and saturation layer. So we'll start there with hue and saturation. I kind of break this process into two steps. One is looking at the sky and one is looking at the foliage. If I select master, the master setting here, there's all a variety of colors selected. And I adjust the hue, I'm going to see all the colors shift. So everything will shift. And that might be a choice that, that you want to make. And that's certainly perfectly valid. Another option is to select this hand picker and use that to select a color of the image. So in this case, I will pick the sky and that will then default me to the blue channel. Now I can make color changes that are isolated to the blues, which is typically going to be just your sky. So if I was trying to say hone in on a more realistic blue, let's see, going to the right makes a little more purple to the left, more teal. And maybe I'll just find a spot here. So just a little bit off of zero gets me to the blue I'm looking for. And then you can play with the saturation, a little more there, and adjust lightness to, to figure out the sort of exact blue sky that I'm looking for. Okay, so now that I've done that, let's look at the foliage. So I'm going to take this hand picker again, and I will select the trees, and that will bring up the yellow option. And so now I can do the same thing with the yellows. I can adjust the colors. So if I drag the hue, I could get way over into the greens and teals, or I could go in the other direction and get into some reds and get us some interesting colors. I like to play with this option a lot. It gives me a lot of flexibility and a lot of creativity in the colors that I choose. However, when you do this, there's one thing that you've got to be aware of. Let's go, let's zoom in on the image a bit, and that is color fringing. So you can kind of see it right here in these trees. If I set the hue back to zero, you won't notice any fringing. The, there's a reasonable color blend between the sky and the trees. As I'm grabbing just the yellows to change the color, the farther I get from zero, you'll start to see a color 
sort of halo because the HSL is not able to perfectly grab the colors that are right at that transition between the blue and the orange in order to convert those colors. That's something you want to be aware of when shifting the hue, and you may decide to limit the amount of shift that you do if you have an image that's going to res result in a lot of uh, that sort of halo effect around your edges. So definitely something to be aware of. So let's play with this and find a color that I like. Maybe I will go towards a more of a yellow and adjust the saturation. I'm going to really kick up the saturation here just, just so I can get the right color of yellow that I'm looking for. And then I'll bring the saturation back down. Something a little more reasonable. Tweak the lightness a bit. Okay, so there's a color that I'm happy with. And so now I've made, I've made adjustments to both the sky and the trees to get the exact colors that I'm looking for. So the next thing I want to do is deal with a smudge that I've got up here. It could have been something on my lens or maybe maybe some dirt on my sensor, but I've got a little bit of a smudge here in the corner that I want to be able to get rid of. And um, I've got a couple choices. So if I select my layer and I try to use the spot healing brush, which is what I would commonly use in Photoshop, the challenge is, as I'm getting this not symbol, I can't edit this layer because it is a smart object. And if I click on it, you will see that I'm getting this warning that the image has to be rasterized. This kind of relates to what I was talking to about earlier about being able to work with camera raw as a smart object or having to rasterize your image. One of the challenges that you're going to have to deal with the more advanced you get with Photoshop is trying to find a balance of keeping an image in raw as long as you can to make the images you want, but then deciding when you're comfortable rasterizing it and accepting the set Things that you've made in camera raw and starting to work with it as as a rasterized image. Fortunately for something like the spot healing there's another option that we can use and that option is within camera raw. So let's cancel out of here go back and what we'll do is we'll open up this image by double clicking on the layer which will open up the image back in camera raw. So now we're back in camera raw. We don't have the color swap we had in Photoshop but you know we can still get a good idea of some of the things we're doing in the image and we can leverage a lot of the tools that exist in Camera Raw while still preserving this as a raw image. So let's go over to the Spot Removal tool and we'll select that. And now that gives me a tool that I can use to highlight. Let me get rid of my little yellow highlight circle there. And now I can find the smudge and there we go. So just like in Lightroom, Spot Healing is a nice tool that you can use in Camera Raw to make adjustments to your image. Now I want to do a little bit of sort of dodging and burning. You can do that in Photoshop, of course, but I'm going to do it in Camera Raw because I like some of the flexibility of the tools that I have here. So let's look at the some of the variety of tools we have. So let's start with a graduated filter. So I can take a graduated filter. In this case, I'm going to hold the Shift key so that I'm drawing a straight line. And I'm going to bring this up on the bottom half of the image. And what I'd like to do, I'm going to reset the local corrections to zero. What I'd like to do is just drop the exposure by about a third of a stop, just to, just to try to draw the eye up in the image towards the more interesting subjects in the center. Then uh, I'm going to do the same thing, but with a radial filter. So I'm going to take a crater radial filter and we'll draw these mountains on the left. I want to kind of cut the highlights here that exist. So I'm going to draw an image there and we will, the exposure drops and maybe we'll cut the highlights a little bit more. Just try to draw some of the attention away from that. The brightest spots of the image will tend to draw the eye. So that's a little bit too hot. I might even drop it a little bit more. So maybe to maybe a half a stop. So we've looked at the graduated filter and a radial filter. Now let's look at a brush filter. So I'll pick up an adjustment brush here and this will allow me to draw in the image. So let me zoom in a little bit and uh, I want to I want to work on the, the face of the half dome here. I'm going to hold down the shift key in order to grab the hand and give me some flexibility here to move around. So let's see, I'm going to turn off my highlighter again. We've got a good size here and I'm going to turn on auto mask so that I'm limiting what I draw. And I'm also going to turn on mask options so that I can see the mask that I'm creating. And I'm going to go pretty quickly here, but you can spend more time being 
more precise for other images. The, the auto mask will help uh, keep the changes within the edges. That's actually done a pretty good job. Sometimes though, when you have a hotspot within the area, it can, it can prevent that from being selected. So I'm gonna turn off auto mask and then do one little pass here to make sure I've captured all of this. Okay, there we go. So now I'll turn off the mask and I will reset uh, my local corrections again. I want to lighten it up a bit. I don't wanna bring it up too much because it'll wash out the face. So let's take the shadows and bring up the shadows just a hair. I think I'm gonna zoom out a bit now that I've made my selection so that I can see how it looks with the rest of the image. So bringing the shadows up and then I'm gonna bring up the clarity a bit because I still wanna retain some punch and some contrast in the face. Okay, so that's really nice. I like what that's done. So I think I'm done in camera raw. So let's hit okay. So that's saving the changes that I've made and now applying those into Photoshop. So there's one more change I'd like to make here to the colors and that is with a color balance. So if I come down to the adjustment layers, I can add a color balance adjustment layer. I wanna make sure that this is at the top so that it's affecting everything below it. What I'm going to do is make a couple tweaks to the highlights and shadows. So let's come up to here on the tone and I wanna select shadows and I wanna take the shadow just a hint to the blue. So you can especially see this in the face of the half dome here. We've got a, just a little bit of a blue. That's kind of how, how the, uh, the color temperature would look uh, normally. You'd be a little more blue in the shadows, so I like the look of that. And then I want to offset that by coming to the highlights and doing about the same amount in the highlights, roughly just a hint, just a hint. You know, you, you barely even notice it. Uh, I want it to be very subtle. But if I come down to the color balance layer and I hide and show that, this is with this uh, slight adjustment to color balance turned on, and this is off. So you can see that just this little tweak to the colors, making the shadows slightly more blue and the highlights slightly more white, adds a lot of contrast to the image, a lot of apparent contrast. There's lots of ways you can add contrast to image, and, and, and this is one that I really like. Color balance is a great tool. Unfortunately, it's one tool that's not available in Camera Raw or in Lightroom. It's only available in Photoshop. So I really like adding color balance to images uh, when I'm working on them in Photoshop. So I've got a couple downloads that can really be used to speed up your workflow when you're working in Photoshop. The first is the infrared profile pack. This is a collection of profiles for over 100 cameras that can help you set a good white balance and do that really easily. Unfortunately, the tooling that Adobe has is very old and it doesn't work sometimes with modern operating systems. So using the infrared profile pack avoids the hassle and just gets you the profiles you need to edit your image. The other is a collection of actions in Photoshop. So these actions are primarily used for swapping your colors like the channel mixer or the invert method. You can just click an action, hit go, and it applies the color swap to your image immediately. So the, these are really useful tools. Both are free and available for download. Links are in the description. If you find these videos helpful on your infrared photography journey, please consider liking, subscribing, or leaving a comment. Do you have any topics related to infrared photography that you'd like to see addressed? Leave a comment below. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.